So you're gonna speak from there. I'm sorry, you're trying to speak from there. That'll be good because we'll get good audio. Okay. for coming to the show. I just want to say my friends and family, a lot of them couldn't make it, but I'm really glad to see you all. And then my friends and family can watch it on the video. And here's my definition of astigmatism, as you can read. So um, I came here, I want to give you a brief bio, I came here from Vietnam and I was about seven years old, I came over to America and I came over here for good education and a good life. So 
my family was extremely respectful of uh, our culture and we were very, very close. As you can see, we were a large family and we did lots of things together. And really, they were very supportive, even though I was the only deaf person in the family. So you can see here this picture, the gentleman lying down here is actually my grandfather. And in our tradition, we uh, were very respectful of someone who died and we didn't wear black. It wasn't really a sad occasion. Many times we would wear white, as you can see here in the picture, different than this culture. And the reason why I chose that picture, even though it's faded and kind of grainy a little bit, is I really, really love it because it captures the culture and it captures the differences in Vietnam versus here in the United States. So um, one of the things that was difficult is because I was the only deaf person in my family, communication kind of broke down. And English wasn't my first language and still isn't my first language. And sign language wasn't either. I started with Vietnamese. So really, the sign communication could sometimes be a great challenge. So I wanted to go through and kind of give you an idea of my background. I went to NTID and I started with graphic design. So this is an introduction to my artistic background. <laughs> Someone's going, okay. Someone's going, it's going off. So my first major was graphic design, but really art. I'm not very artistic actually by hand, so that felt a little bit awkward, but it was good for my foundation. And my major was graphic design at NTID. So this art here, I don't want to give you a false impression, it's not my art, it's someone else's art, but I followed this design. This was kind of what I attained and, and strove for when I was in my program at NTID. So I also um, tended to, because of graphic design, uh, focus on Photoshop and Illustrator and getting my foundational skills in these programs. So I decided to change my uh, major from graphic design to general art, and I really wanted to refine and perfect my skills. That was my goal. So you can see this is my Japper art here, uh, and this was from two years ago. So um, what I did is I also you know, really wanted to focus on more photo and landscape. They were the two areas I loved the most. And I really loved to make lines at this stage in my, in my art development.
So, you know, half of the time I was stuck here because I didn't have a car, it was really, really sad. But, um, so I couldn't really go on a lot of vacations and things like that, but I used this natural environment here in beautiful Lake Tahoe to take my pictures. And these are also an experimentation and taking some pictures with a time mark, which I hadn't done a whole lot of before. So this is ice in my BFA work here, and I really tried to challenge myself compared to Jabber, where I just kind of would get outside of my box and my comfort zone. So what I try to do is experiment more. I really like to have things sharp and crisp, and what I try to experiment more with is having things outside of that sharpness and crispness and being more blurry, and you can really define lines. So the teachers here really, really encouraged us to be outside of our box and to play around and not be scared of doing that. So that's what I attempted to do is play around outside my comfort zone. So what I did is I really took opportunity to come to some of the exhibits here and really study <coughs> the different exhibits and see what makes a person an individual artist. So what I did is I decided I would reuse some things that I hadn't used before that I just kind of discarded and thrown aside. So I started with that process of using things that had been discarded. So what I decided to do is I said, why not remake something? Why not retranslate something and make it into something new based on what I had done before? So understanding that art is not one of my skills, like by hand drawing, I attempted to just experiment with that and use that skill to the best of my ability. So then I also got into layering and I noticed that there was, it was a possibility to maybe cut things out and layer on top of my images. So I used clean, clean edges as well as also some torn edges. So basically the torn, torn items are mostly images and memories from my childhood and from the past. So what I did here is, even though I covered it up, it doesn't mean it was necessarily a bad memory. It wasn't a bad memory, but I just wanted to use that memory and change it somehow to represent the present day. So this is a digital photograph, and I'm not sure exactly what the word is. I didn't really want to like abuse my art, but I did. I kind of tore it up, and you know, 
uh, wrestled it around a little bit and uh, wanted to see what it would look like if I did that. So what I did here is, um, in some of these photographs, I would take a photograph and then take a photograph of a photographed photograph, and then I would change that, maybe make a scratch on it or a wrinkle or something like that, and then perhaps photo Photoshop some effects. So what I did here is I also experimented with taking things close up because in my background I was also more comfortable with landscaping, so I started to take pictures that were closer up, more close shots. And now I'm losing my thoughts, sorry. <laughs> So what I also did is I really worked on different perspectives, given my culture, my deafness, and things like this. I wanted that reflected in my work, that there could be different perspectives to how this is viewed and translated. So then what I also did is I really noticed that if I layered things and if I also did some photoshopping, it would give it a different perspective and it would give it different texture. And also using recycled materials really became part of what my work was at this stage. So this is a variety of different papers that I experimented with as well. This one probably should have actually been before the last slide, but the position of it is a little off. So what happened is I originally started with this very, very small. It was very tiny, and you can tell maybe by the tack how small the, the picture was, and that was in my comfort zone. And then I blew it up, and you'll notice it's larger um, in my gallery there, and that was outside of my comfort zone to make it so large. So this, you'll also notice the hand on here, and it's um, considered like what's called a photogram, and it's just a process in the dark room as well. So in Japper, I like to use um, fine lines, I like to use hard lines, I like to use frames, I like things to be even. And I really experimented here with just, um, you know, coming outside of that and not having things even, and not having things clear, and having things more blurry, really the opposite of what my Japper art was. Another thing that was different is I was used to using a formal frame which cost a little bit more rather than like just tape and glue and sticky stuff and whatever would make it hold so it was a cheaper process to do this work also.
So I really love color, but what I noticed is that if I went more towards black and white, then that was a little bit more opposite of what I had been working with. So I really wanted to stick with that. And that black and white actually made things um, a little bit clearer sometimes, the difference between contrast. And the reason why I also focused on black and white was because of us. <laughs> So another thing I like about black and white, though, that I've learned to like is that it really, uh, it allows the imagination really to kind of be more active in the process. It doesn't define things quite as much as color. So for me, also, I'm very visual and I'm very expressive, given my deafness, and so the whole imagination thing is really appealing because I do that a lot when I don't understand something. I imagine what it might be. So another thing I was used to working, being very particular and a perfectionist, and this whole process here was encouraging me not to do that, not to be a perfectionist, and that was a little bit hard for me, but it allowed me to be not so much sloppy, but a little bit more carefree in how I express my art. process is I'm really awful with design space. I can do the work, but to actually design a space or a studio space was really a challenge for me. Okay. This is just me. So the reason why I use this is it's very different than the first traditional picture I showed you guys, obviously. So it's, it's really coming out of my tradition into where I am today. It's digital versus, you know, the hard copy photo. And um, it's also a little bit more less, it's less formal as well. So the picture of the three of us over here, that's Tet, T-E-T, -E which is a Vietnamese New Year. And um, so that was kind of a fun occasion. And then the other picture is with my goddaughter. I haven't seen her for a long time, but it's a real special photo. So really, um, I hope that you all can see that my work will be in a, a, really a compilation of my Japper work and then also my work now to be an expression of myself and um, my perspective on culture and deafness and all these things that make up me. And hopefully that art will, will show that. So hopefully you're going to be able to go over there and see it. You can't see it at the moment, but you'll be able to see it when you leave here. The difference um, of perspective as well is really important for me as a deaf person and given my culture and background. So I'm done. <laughs>
what was the push in photography once you really started practicing just general art? Well, I kind of felt like I didn't really think about um, art very much, to be honest with you. For me, um, it was kind of difficult. Also, just the learning process because of the English aspect was very difficult, so I was more tended towards visual art and graphic design and things like this because I liked, I would have to say the visual aspect of it really fit me well. Um, I would also have to say that like, I had a lot of my imagination what to do versus the learning process of like, the actual foundation of art. And also family pictures, they were really important to me, so that was a good photographic um, entry there, is they were super important. Black and white, some were colored, but the color was faded, and I was really fascinated with that, and they seemed almost ruined, but I thought, well, I could use these to my benefit in my artwork because they held so many good memories for me. What do you think is one of the biggest things that you've learned about yourself and about your art practice by pushing yourself to think outside of the box and outside of your comfort zone? Wow, to try not to be so shy. <laughs> Did you have a question, Steph? I wanted to make a comment. I thought it was interesting that you said that, um, I guess because I haven't taken photography class, I, I wouldn't know this, but um, that eliminating color can leave you more open for interpretation and, and leave more room for the imagination to fill it in. I had never really seen that in that perspective, and I just thought that, that was a really interesting comment. Say that again. I'm sorry, a little louder. Uh, the formal decisions. Can you talk about the formal decisions that you made with uh, some of the different mediums, like the paint and the, uh, the charcoal? Well, first, you know, I wanted to continue with the way I had been doing things. I wanted to continue with my photography and stuff because I was comfortable with that. But then what happened is I decided, especially with, like, drawing, I need to probably get something involved there because it hadn't been one of my skills before in college. And I hadn't used it, and I thought I wouldn't be using it again, you know, and I just felt like um, that's not comfortable, so I probably need to go ahead and explore that. And Jessica, did you have a question? Pieces on the floor, did you say? Well, you know, first of all, I put things on the wall, and then there was nothing on the floor. It felt a little bit empty to me, so I felt I needed to add something there. And then the last time I tried like to use glass, I had some glass going on, but it didn't really match things. It didn't match what I had going on in there. It was pretty disjunct. So what I decided to do is I printed out some pictures and I put them on the floor and I felt like, you know, if they were on the wall, we would focus on the wall, but I wanted some focus on the floor to keep the, the perspective a variety of a perspective. So for me, it was in my mind that I don't only have to use the wall, I can use the ceiling, I can use the floor, I can use everything. And for me, that was also probably like trying to access my memory bank. Like some of my memories on the floor are more accessing past memory bank. Also, it's really interesting with like, I noticed on the floor, you know, the cracks that are on the floor, they gave me like a little bit of perception on um, before like a timeline that I had in my memory, 
if like I pulled something out of that timeline, then it, it wouldn't be there. So for me, the cracks kind of represent a timeline, and I wanted to put a bit of my memories on that timeline. Whoa. <laughs> 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 Yes, I do. I believe they would. Because I'm hoping, you know, that they'll look at the work and they'll say, well, maybe I'd get, like to get to know her. Did Kathy have a question? Does someone have a question? Yeah, I was wondering, so is it NTID was the school you'd mentioned? Yes, NTID. Is that in New York? It's National Institute for Technology of the Deaf. It's different. It goes by different names, so like people call it different things. Yes, it was in New York. Yes. So, how did you find out about Sierra College? And I'm just wondering about the decision to go from a deaf school to obviously a school that obviously doesn't cater to that. Because it seems like it's all about breaking tradition with your culture, the type of school, the type of you're comfortable with. So I just wanted you to talk more about that decision. Okay, well, this is a weird one, but anyway, it's a story. Um, so when I toured around, you know, different colleges and stuff, um, I wanted to look at the colleges and what, you know, I brought everything to the table. My sister, my brother came, we visited all the colleges, and I tried, like, some were expensive, some weren't as expensive, some were focusing more on, you know, intellectual, some more artistic. And that was great. You know, the location here, to be honest with you, was super appealing. I remember I was in the landscape at that time, so my experience here, like in New York, comparatively trying to do landscape in New York, where it's so flat and all that other stuff, forget it. Can't really do it so well. So here, like, that was definitely appealing to me. And then I remember also I asked this man, I believe, I asked him, do you have any deaf people here? And he's like, deaf people? No way. No, there's no deaf people here. And I was like, whoa, I'd be the only one. So, um... So anyway, that's, I made my decisions, I kind of jotted down all my ideas, the mountains were definitely appealing to me, the landscaping was appealing, and I just wanted to try something outside my comfort zone, really, opposite of what I had experienced. I wanted to expand my experience, so. I had a question about collage. Um, the collage piece that you have on the wall, the form that it takes is really um, organic, I guess. And I'm really curious as to how you decided to create that shape, if the wall dictated, you know, something that you wanted to cover the wall with but still have some sort of negative <coughs> space, or was it the photographs that you had kind of been compiling them based on what was in the photos, or was it just the torn edges of the photos that you wanted to line up in a certain manner and create a shape? Well, honestly, I struggled for this. I, I struggled on this one. I, I was struggling between something formal and then something not so formal. I, I struggled also between... like, kind of like the scrub edges and things like that. So what I did is I, I used the edges to try to make a shape first. So I used like the, whether or not it was going to be horizontal or vertical, and I would look at my edges and I just kind of played around with them. And I started to put them together and I kind of felt as if there was a balance. Like that was my big thing probably for the shape, is I just wanted the space to feel balanced and that shape made it feel more balanced. Okay. Anybody have another question? Yes, go ahead. Because I, um, I was wondering, just about the shift in ideas of beauty, where uh, in the in the in the Jabra work, uh, you know, it's, it was very conventional and very easy to digest. Sort of the idea of beauty uh, that was visible there. You know, I, 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 yeah, like this Jabra. Right. Yeah. You know, I I think um, I think the work that's in the gallery now is 
um, still very beautiful. Um, in fact, it's actually more beautiful to me. But uh, I, I, you know, I don't know if that's a beauty that's immediately accessible to everyone. But you know, I don't know. Maybe some people would be confused by it. Some people might think like, well, you know, what, whatever. It's, it's like a, a trash world <laughs> you know, um, that uh, went through, through the gallery. And, and I guess I'm just kind of curious sort of what value you see, or if, if you do see a value, in sort of changing the terms of beauty in how your work is progressed. I think that's a really good question. First of all, like with Jack Ryan, like the focus really was beauty. Like, you know, I'd look at something and I'd appreciate its beauty and I'd take a picture of it and then I would have that. I would have that experience, I would have that beauty to take with me or whatnot, that location. Um, and I remember, like, with my family and stuff, too, my family would, would tell me, you're really beautiful, you're really beautiful. And I would be, I'd be like, me? I'm not so much a beautiful person. But, you know, they were my family, so of course they'd say that. But anyway, there's a conflict there. So really, like, some of it was like, not everything is beautiful. So, um, you know, that was some of it, is I wanted to kind of turn that on its head a little bit and look at things that maybe weren't as beautiful, visually. And also, I really wanted to try to find my own path in art, and I'm not, I'm not sure I've, I've done that yet. Like, deaf and hearing world, I really wanted, because my, all my training has been, you know, from the deaf world, but more hearing, hearing standards, and foundation, so I really want to try to find my place as a deaf artist. I guess that also is why I've experimented with that style. Is, does that answer your question? I'm not sure I've answered your question. <laughs> okay, so no. you're more focused on real beauty instead of take away beauty now. Like carry out beauty, drive through beauty. thing was working so we could backtrack but um you said something about the deaf world and the hearing world how there's sort of a compartmentalization that they're separate however I would think that the nice thing about visual art is that it transcends the deaf and the hearing world all those differences I mean do you feel that it does or do you feel like even in the art that you struggle with sometimes a translation between your work as a deaf artist to those in the hearing world. Well, I think it might depend like on the deaf or the hearing person. Like for example, for myself with art, I know growing up all the hearing people um, you know, they didn't know a whole lot about my culture, they didn't know a whole lot about me, that's for sure. It was my job to really try to figure out what they were saying. And then I remember in high school, I learned C sign, it's signing exact English. It was a different style of sign language. It actually was English, basically. It wasn't, it wasn't the signs of the deaf. It was not, like ASL is American Sign Language, it's very visual, very different. But C sign I learned first, so I really never had that visual foundation like a lot of deaf people do because the language wasn't visual. So I really felt from a very young age like I needed to communicate and fit into the deaf world, that my, that my deafness was kind of pushed aside, that I needed to fit into the hearing world, excuse me, interpreter correction there. But then uh, as I grew up, I wanted to become more involved in the deaf world, went to college, and that became a big part of who I then became. So I think like deaf people are more sensitive, I would say, because they don't have hearing, obviously, so visually they're a lot more sensitive. <clears throat> but also I would say that hearing people are a lot more auditory, you know, they're more, they notice things, they notice sounds, they notice distractions, things like that. Where with the deaf person, we don't have that, so it's very easy, I think, sometimes to focus. A lot of hearing people, it's very difficult to focus because there's so many outside auditory distractions. So maybe that helps you appreciate the art more? I don't know.
I'm not sure I understand what you're saying. Can you say it again? Um, I guess she's busted too. <laughs> <laughs> the difference between um, photography and then moving on to basically collage, which is a completely different mindset, um, and kind of incorporating mark making by painting and drawing. Was there something that you learned that you really liked? that you might want to use again, or things that you discovered you really don't like, that you could never want to try again. Well, I can say that, I would say like as a visual artist, I've been influenced by the visual aspect of what I've created over there. So I would say like, probably through my photography, I'm gonna try like to, as myself, I like things formal and clean. That's just kind of who I am. And I'm going to try to maybe keep that disorder, if you want to call it that, and try to work with that a little bit. I'm going to try to learn something new from that and, you know, understand that if this could be a different experience for you too, maybe you don't like things so neat and clean. So I'm going to try to stay on the path of experimentation. Um, my second question was, where do you plan on going after this? Do you plan on getting an MFA or moving back and being with your family and, and working on your work there? I would say after I graduate, I'm going to be moving back to my hometown. Sure. I can't stay here. No. One person deaf, it's, too, it's been too long. Two years is enough for that. I need to go back to like my real world, if you want to call it that. But um, I've got a very good friend, and my, my friend's daughter, who you saw in the picture. They recently moved here, back to California. And so at the same time, I really want to be with them, and then I will look for a job. And you know, I'll take these experiences and learn from them and continue to grow. Do we so, have another question? <laughs> so, um, do, you, do you kind of go to, what kind of a career do you hope to pursue in this? Like, do you hope to uh, sort of become an artist or maybe work for a magazine or a, you know? You know, the economy is really terrible right now, so it might be difficult, but with art, having my degree in art, um, art appreciation, I haven't decided yet, you know, what I want to do, but I'll see what, what options are out there. I think I need to be flexible. I also enjoy traveling, so I'm planning on doing some of that as well before I move on with other things. <laughs> Experimenting with earplugs, so the audience can't hear anything around them with no any outside distractions. And has she ever done that before? Like sound, sound cancellation. Yes, for hearing people, you mean? Yes. Oh, okay, I thought you meant for her. I was like, she's deaf. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I 
think that would be a great idea. I think you should try it. I think sound cancellation would be good, you know? You know, also there's like, um, well, for me, like, I don't even hear music, so music's not even a distraction. I know a lot of people, like, work with music. Maybe that might be a first step is turning off the music, you know? Or, like, also, like, I feel vibration. So floor vibration or things like that, you know? Like, vibrations I can feel. So, I mean, I guess I get that sensory input. But the first thing, for me, I can't hear anything. I only if you scream super, 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 super loud. So, you know, and I feel, like, a heartbeat sometimes inside me. But other than that, I don't hear anything, so... But you might want to experiment with that, yeah. I'd say yeah. Uh, one quick last question. Where are we going after this? <laughs> <laughs> Where is she going after this? Where are you going after this? Are we doing anything? Do you mean physically after this event? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to go get some dinner. And then I'm going to go probably... I'm going to go paddle wheel. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go paddle wheel. But I also need to also get my bike. So I, anyway, we'll see what we're going to do. <laughs> I just want to clarify that. Yeah. I know we don't have a wheel. Okay. I thought we were going to paddle wheel the bar. I got it. Paddle wheel the bar. So, so in, in closing and saying, saying thank you, I also wanted to make what, one comment about the, the sort of earplug thing that may or may not have been apparent, but it was something that we were, we were trying, and I'm not sure how effective it really was, but one of, in addition to the you know, sound and canceling and trying to find ways that an audience can, can work with you know, Crystal's multiple layers of, of language, we were messing around with the idea of delaying because like if you notice, like that was a great joke about like, well, why would she need earplugs? She's deaf already. But like like Crystal laughed, but it was like you know thirty seconds later, right? And so we we, we were thinking about sort of extending that sense of delay between interpretation and conversation, um, but I'm not sure that was completely apparent to people. <laughs> anyway, I want I wanted to make that point <laughs> that there's multiple ways of going after that stuff, and I think it's really. Anyway, thank you, Crystal. I want to thank my interpreter. <laughs>